Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. As a generalist in the community settings, we get to see and treat all cancers. In order to stay up to date with all that is happening around us, we've recently covered studies in multiple myeloma and CLL from ASH 2023. However, there was so much exciting data, particularly phase three data in myelofibrosis as well, and some early data for AML. To focus on these studies, we're joined by Dr. Uma Barade from Ohio State University. Uma, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Welcome, Uma. Uma, even before we talk about what we saw at ASH 2023, it is important to acknowledge where we stand from myelofibrosis. We have approval for ruxolotinib a long time ago, and recently momolotinib. Sure, these are small wins, but nothing really groundbreaking uh, where transplant still remains the only curative option. At ASH 2023, we saw two phase three studies. One was Transform 1 and Manifest 2. The first one talking about the Transform 1, which looks at JAK2 inhibitor in combination with Nevitoclax, BCL2 and BCLXL uh, inhibitor. Though the thought is that I believe myelofibrosis and leukemia has overexpression of this particular uh, inhibitor, or rather the expression. Can you please go over the study design for this trial? Sure. So I think the premise of both the transform and manifest studies is really to look at whether it's better to treat newly diagnosed myelofibrosis patients that are high risk and need treatment with two agents together with combination therapy instead of single agent therapy like rustlotinib, momolotinib, fedratinib, all of which have approved indications. And so the study design um, is, I think, really straightforward. It includes these high risk patients. They have to be intermediate to a high risk myelofibrosis as defined by the DIPS Plus. As, as your listeners might know, there's unfortunately several scoring systems, but this is the one that was chosen for this study. Um, they have to have MF-related symptoms, and we'll talk about this because one of the primary endpoints of both these studies is actually the symptom score, which is very different from you know an objective finding like spleen reduction and so on. They cannot have had prior JAK therapy. These are newly diagnosed patients, and then they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either RUX plus Nabitoclax, which is a BCL2 to Excel inhibitor, and the control arm was Rux plus placebo. Uma, this disease continues to be challenging to manage in clinical settings, be it symptom management or just the cytopenias that come along, and we of course need more efficient drugs. So what did the data show here for Transform 1? So I think that the big thing, um, as, as you're showing on your slide, is Firstly, they really wanted to look at improvement, and by improvement, they wanted to look at improvement really with spleen reduction, and this study did meet the primary endpoint compared to Rux plus placebo in terms of spleen reduction. Um, about, you know, more than 63% of patients did achieve that spleen reduction and improvement um, from baseline at week 24, which was one of the primary endpoints. They did show that this combination seemed to be a uh, pretty fairly well tolerated, but I think as you're showing on your screen, one of the big things with Nevitoclax is the grade of thrombocytopenia, and this is definitely significant compared to Rux alone. Um, I think what they didn't really show is um, the, the symptom score reduction that they had aimed for was not something that was met on this study. Um, and I think this is a big challenge when you have an agent like Rux that you're comparing it to, which is very effective for symptoms, whether the addition of another agent actually moves the needle um, in that specific realm. Thanks for covering that. And that's where we want to get into more of a practical aspect or how to apply to community itself. But before we do that, uh, let's go over Manifest 2, which was again in myelofibrosis phase three study and how it really changed the outcome there. Yep, and I think it's the same exact study design, same exact sort of, um, you know, presumption. Can combination therapy do better? The only difference I would say here was they were looking at the DIP score and they were looking at intermediate one or higher. So slightly less high risk patients, if you want to call it that, you know, randomized to pilabrisib plus RUX versus RUX alone and placebo. Same primary endpoint of spleen reduction. But one of the key secondary endpoints um, is again looking at the symptom score and the reduction of um, significant reduction of symptoms by week 24. I think the, the 
the difference here is again, you know, they met their primary endpoint. Um, there wasn't that significant in terms of a uh, uh, symptom reduction score from baseline. This was a key secondary endpoint. And I think the the big question for one wide usage in the community, but even before that, approval of these agents moving forward in combination settings and frontline is, is this enough to convince regulatory agencies that a combination approach for newly diagnosed patients is actually superior to RUCs, given that now you're adding toxicity with a second agent? Uma, thank you for going over these two studies quickly. But looking at these two agents, Nevada-Clax, BCL2 inhibitor, is it just another me too venetoclax So it's not a me too venetoclax because it's a bcl Excel inhibitor that's slightly different from a BCL2 inhibitor. The bcl Excel pathway overexpression is, I think, more key to diseases like myelofibrosis, whereas BCL2 inhibition is much more important in AML. So I do think it is um, a, a significant effective agent in this disease setting. I think the unfortunate thing about BCL Excel inhibitors like nabidoclax is they cause some pretty severe thrombocytopenia. And as all of you know, your myelofibrosis patients already are challenged with low counts. Um, even with the rocks, you know, we can't completely use it in thrombocytopenic patients. So if you now give an agent that drops the platelet counts, you're definitely challenged um, in using it long-term in combination therapy. These counts do recover with time, so it's not something that that persists over time, but I think it's another reason, as you said, you know, applicability, widespread in the community. I think that's something we need to definitely look out for. And then coming back to Manifest 2, this is a BET pathway inhibitor. One big question that we continue to ask when we're adding these two medications, not just in this trial, but any trial, are these additive or is there some synergy that we're seeing? What are your thoughts? I think that is a million dollar um, question. I think the hope is that there's synergy, but do we absolutely know that for a fact? I, I would say we we still don't. I still I, I think the jury is still out. While we are waiting approvals on these agents, say for example, that they do get approved. Now in the setting of single agent approvals, which we already have with these combinations, in what case scenarios would you rely on these uh, combination versus single agents in that setting? So I think for me, um, if I were to choose combination therapy over single agent, I would really be very specific to the patient and on what the goal is for the patient in terms of therapy. So if I had a very severely symptomatic patient um, who otherwise, you know, was a transplant candidate, you know, had a donor, um, was relatively otherwise doing well with not a lot of comorbidities, but the real key to getting them to a curative transplant, as you said, that is only our, our only curative option, is to control their disease as soon as possible, including spleen reduction, including, you know, decrease their transfusion burden and help their performance status, then I would prioritize combination therapy over single agent therapy. But if I had an older symptomatic myelofibrosis patient where transplant is not on the table, the goal is really quality of life and obviously, you know, hopefully prolonging life, then I'm not sure that I would prefer a combination approach up front. I would still prioritize single agent therapy to give the patient the best quality of life without the added toxicity. Well, that's certainly very important. Now, if uh, one was to decide between the two doublets itself, I know we are, we'll have to wait for a longer term uh, data to really decide on that if it plays out one way or the other, but in what way you will decide one or the other out of the two? I, I think I would, um, one, look at counts, and I says, as mentioned, Nevedoclax definitely has concerns with thrombocytopenia, so that would not be my first go-to doublet if the patient clearly has low counts. Um, I know for um, pilabrosib and BET inhibitors in general, you know, GI toxicities are, are something that's been described, a rash and so on. So if that's something that you feel your patient really is not able to tolerate given, you know, MF and symptoms that they have, then I think that might not be your first go-to um, if, if a patient has many other GI symptoms in the beginning. Thanks. So keeping these side effect toxicity profiles going to be important. But again, we need more for this disease. Absolutely. All right, let's switch gears. 
We have been very mindful on our platform of not covering very early phase data because most of these studies don't make it through for yeah. us to use in our clinic. Yeah. But both of these studies here, SAVE and Augment 101, show very high response rate with this oral menin inhibitor. And this got a lot of traction. Uma, starting off with SAVE study, your thoughts here. Yeah, I think the menin inhibitor pathway was sort of, I would say, the story of ash and myeloid malignancies. <laughs> and I think, um, and I think you, you know, what you guys brought up exactly points to that. And I think the reason for this is that this pathway really targets two very um, different mutations and different risk categories in AML, but has shown as a single agent to be extremely effective as you know one pill that a patient takes in patients that have relapsed or are refractory to multiple therapies, including transplants. So the late breaking abstract, which um, showed augment 101 trial results, and this is a, a study that's been ongoing for a while. It include relapsed refractory AML patients that were either NPM1 or KMT2A mutated. And KMT2A is a rearrangement um, with this specific sort of um, chromosome 11, but it can have multiple rearrangement partners. But the commonality of all of these different mutations and rearrangements is that they really converge on the menin pathway. And what happens when menin kind of binds to these different transcription factors that are affected, you get a maturation RS very similar to sort of the APL and the 1517 um, um, RAR alpha story. So when menin inhibitors are given in this setting, you sort of release this differentiation block and the cells start to differentiate and you get sort of normal hematopoiesis. So it's a very elegant way of treating two very different mutations with the end result being normal hematopoiesis. And so this study, um, the Augment 101 study, which was a late breaker, looked specifically at a menin inhibitor called Ravuminib um, and its efficacy at the recommended phase two dose in both these uh, types of AML. And I think the, the story, the reason it generated all this excitement is these patients were heavily pretreated with an overall response rate um, in the intent to treat population of almost 63% with almost, I would say, you know, 18 to 20 percent CRs, which is not really something you commonly see in um, heavily pretreated AML patients. And then this was sort of the story was added to in the safe, as you said, very early um, trial, but they combined ASA, VEN, which is you know is our favorite <laughs> doublet for AML doctors, and then they added rivumanib to the same patient population. Um, they also included a few other mutations like NUP98, which also have this whole menin pathway at play, and they again showed some really, really nice responses. Again, very early data, uh, but very high relapse-free survival rates and overall survival rates. And, uh, granted, the follow-up is only six months, but now you're talking about an all-oral combination um, directed to some mutations that that are um, you know, not easy to treat once a patient has relapsed, and you're showing these very nice data, very good safety, easy to take, not, some, not a lot of terrible side effects except differentiation, which as we know, we've seen in a lot of these sort of differentiating type therapies. You talk about the oral therapy. That's extremely important, especially for community oncologists and even more important for uh, physicians who are me, where we are practicing in rural setting where patients can't even travel to tertiary or quaternary centers. Precision medicine is extremely important in solid tumor. And again, it just continues to stress the importance of that in liquid um, liquid tumor burden as well here uh, with leukemia. Now, any particular side effects that we should keep in mind? Because we will be utilizing it once, of course, uh, this makes it through for further studies as well as FDA approval. So the, I think the big key with rivumanib, which I'm sure there, you know, there will be many other menin inhibitors of um, with the same mechanism of action, but this is sort of first to market as we call it. The big thing is QTC prolongation, and there is definitely significant drug-drug interactions with other CYP3 pathway metabolizers. So, for example, venetoclax is a good example. If you're combining a drug like rivumanib with venetoclax, you have to monitor QTC. On top of that, let's say you're adding 
levaquinas prophylaxis or you're giving Zofran for, you know, nausea, then QTC prolongation is a definite concern. I think that is one thing to watch for. So, you know, just very careful combination strategies with other drugs, including antiemetics. The second thing is differentiation syndrome. And this is nothing to be sneezed at with um, menin inhibitors. You know, you we think that it may be better if you're combining it with Azaven. However, if the drug is effective, it's not unusual to see the patient's white cloud suddenly go up and the way the patient will complain to you would be, you know, low extremity swelling, shortness of breath, cough, um, and, and may or may not have a fever. So I think those would be key things to look for if these this drug does get improved and move into clinical practice. Awesome. These are exciting times, but let's see how the long-term data plays out. Uma, thank you so much for covering all these exciting trials from ASH 2023 with us today. To all listening, please stay tuned for a quick wrap-up. We have covered two studies for myelofibrosis with Dr. Uma Bharati from Ohio State University. Starting with Transform 1, we see that adding nevidoclax to ruxolotinib provided with good response in decreasing the spleen size. Similar findings were seen in Manifest 2, where palabrasib was added to ruxolotinib, and we saw this combination being active as well. We've also covered two early stage studies in acute myeloid leukemia. We see that this new menin inhibitor seems to be an active agent in these early studies. Finding and attacking these driver mutations can be very critical, and hopefully this will continue to help us in the near future with this devastating disease. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to check out our more of ASH and San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2023 highlights on our podcast. And we are the Oncology Brothers.